Hello, my name is Ian Wright and welcome to another session as part of Scott Week's Business Conference Series 2022. I'm a Scott Week board member, but I'm also very privileged to be the president of the American Foundation of the very wonderful University of the Highlands and Islands. Then when people think about Scottish history, it usually has a distinct tartan, largely um, Celt Celtic feel to it. But Scottish history is an even richer cultural heritage than that. For example, people often forget the contribution that Scandinavians have had to Scottish culture. We see it in place names, we hear it in our language, and then we also see it in the very DNA of Scotland today. And to that end, I have the privilege of having a very distinguished guest, Professor Donna Heddle, who is Director of the Institute of Nor Northern Studies and Head of Cultural Heritage at the University of the Highlands and Islands. Hello, Donna. Hello there, Ian. So we saw in our, our video a brief introductory flavour of UHI today, but can you tell us a bit more about UHI and in particular the part you play in the Institute of Northern Studies, its research, the students and, and the work you do with industry? Certainly, and well, lots of people think that UHI is a very new university. Of course, it isn't a new university. The idea for the university started way back in the 17th century, in point of fact. Um, education's always been very important in Scotland. Uh, it's always been a means by which people can improve and, and move on to other things. And it's, uh, we're very proud, it's a very proud boast in Scotland how important education has been. And UHI, the story of UHI has been part of that. Of course, we've had our official university status uh, for 10 years now, but there were many years working up to that. And I'm very happy to be uh, part of uh, University of the Highlands and Islands and to be the director of the Institute for Northern Studies, which actually has a, a campus based in the Orkney Islands, in the Shetland Islands and at Perth College as well, um, as well as colleagues who join us from the other academic partners in UHI as, on the staff. Um, and what we are is we're a, a very unique interdisciplinary institute combining world leading area studies research. I'm going to stop there and tell you exactly what I mean by area studies research. That means that we look at a place in all its times and disciplines. So we're not looking at it just from one perspective. We don't live our lives from one perspective. So we shouldn't study our society from one perspective. So we look at this place, Scotland, um, from all different angles, all different times, all, all different disciplines. But we also do award-winning teaching, we do business consultancy, community engagement activities as well. And in what's called the Research Excellence Framework Exercise, which takes place across all the um, universities in the UK, uh, we came first in Scotland for research impact and fifth equal with the University of Oxford for research environment. So we we're very proud of that. But we are also very proud of uh, the work that we do in the communities, because UHI is all about the communities. It's about the lived experience of communities, past, present and future. And that's very important to us. So we have lots of links with iconic cultural and business initiatives, such as the Edrington Group's Whiskey Valhalla collection, which we were very involved in. Um, and that was where we took our research and knowledge to create a product which uh, helped to uh, safeguard jobs in Orkney and Shetland, places like that, but also promoted the Scottish cultural heritage in a different way. Because when you think about Scotland, of course you think about Tartan, and of course you think about the Loch Ness Monster, and you might think about Sean Connery as well. Um, but uh, there's more to the old story than that. And uh, Tom Houghton story... today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, the story that we, we tell really um, is the story of Scotland, but it's the, we tend to look at it from a slightly different perspective, the, the hidden story, if you like. Um, if you look at a stick of good old seaside rock, you can't always tell what the letters are inside the rock from just looking at it from the outside. So what we do is we explore the letters inside the rock and those letters spell Norsemen. Um, or Norse women, of course, because uh, the, we're not gender mm -hmm. specific in these matters. Um, but the interesting thing about the, the Norse heritage of Scotland is it's so little known. And yet so many of the things that your uh, listeners think of as Scottish are actually of Norse derivation. And it's a story that's kind of been buried because um, at the end of the uh, 18th century, people had a decision to make about what their favourite origin myth was. And there were two main origin myths. One was the Celtic one that we all know and love, and the other was Norse. And Scotland tended to go for the Celtic myth. So the story of the Norse people was lost. Although the Norse occupation of Scotland was actually longer than the Roman uh, age or any of the other ages, but it doesn't have a specific name. 
and it happened just before Scotland really became a kingdom as such. So it's kind of got lost in the midst of history. And people assume that the, the Norse were people who arrived in the middle of the night with horned helmets on their head, at, you know, absolutely full of magic mushrooms and ready to slaughter everybody berserkers. In fact, of course, that means bare shirt. Um, they, they would wear the bear, but of course that wasn't the case at all. They came here, they settled, they gave their names to places, they gave their names to us. I mean, my name's Donna Heddle, Heddle is a Norse surname meaning Hay Valley, uh, allied to Thor Heyerdahl. Some of your listeners may well remember Thor and his intrepid mm -hmm. uh, exploits on rafts, for example. Uh, very typical Norse thing to do. But uh, when we look at how Scotland is and the things that we love about Scotland, the sense of community, for example, um, our Scots law, law is a Norse word, for example. Uh, our Scots law is very much based on Norse tradition. Our uh, namings, um, uh, lots of uh, people out there will have names, surnames like MacLeod, for example, that's son of Leot, or they might be Macaulay, that's son of Olaf, or McSwain, that's son of Swain, uh, and, and, and various other things. And it's, it's really very much buried there. Even the shape of the boats that we have here in the Northern Isles is very, very reminiscent of a Viking longship. And you see that um, in the, the shield and escutcheon of the, the Western Isles, for example, they have the Berlin of Clan Ranald and uh, various things on that as well. So it's a very much a buried story. And it's been my lifelong um, ambition and uh, occupation, if you like, and delight in many ways to bring these stories to the fore because Scotland's such a, a wonderful place and such a complicated and fascinating history and such an old history. You know, we've been, we've been around a long time, Ian, you know? We've been about a bit and we've traveled lots of places too. Uh, as we know, there are 55 million people out there who uh, proudly claim Scots descent. And let's not forget that we put Neil Armstrong on the moon uh, while we're at it. Uh, his father was from the borders of Scotland and he was very proud of that. So we get about, and that's also something I think that's very much part of our Norse heritage. Um, the way that we speak, the language that we use, the color of our hair. Lots of people think that red hair is a Celtic uh, gene. Well. Uh, not so much. Uh, it's much more aligned to static Norse populations and I'm preparing a paper on that. So I'm going to give you a klaxon warning of this is the Donna Hedl theory at the moment, Ian. <laughs> I'll look forward anybody, to that. <laughs> <laughs> whatever he says me in the letters. But what we, ha we, have, we have a rather wonderful time in our research areas. Um, we, we look at Scottish heritage, of course, and we have our online master's programme, which is available all over the world in that. But we also look at island studies, we look at cultural history, we look at intercultural dialogues. How did uh, different groups meet together, the Celts and the Norse in Scotland. How did they get on? Pretty well, Ian, actually. Pretty, pretty well. There's an awful lot of cross-managing going on there. Uh, but we also look at literature, folklore, place names, archaeology, visual sociology, for example. Um, it's, the Vikings are, you know, always sexy. They're very popular at the moment, and it's very interesting how they're portrayed. And so we look at that, we look at, uh, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's fascinating where the horns on the helmets came from. If your audience takes nothing away from this session, Ian, Vikings did not have horns on their helmets. I'm sorry, folks, it did not happen. <laughs> they, they fought too closely together. They would have easily had an eye out. It's not a thing. It's something that happened later on. It was added in to the pictures and so on and so forth. So what we do is uh, we do research projects, of course, all across the world. And in fact, we even find ourselves taking our expertise to the South Pacific. Uh, because you might be interested to know that the um, boundary naming systems of, for example, Vanuatu are just the same as the Viking ones. They're exactly the same, how they, they measure the boundaries of the land masses. So we've done a lot of work there and with tourism. But what we like to do is we like to take our research and take it right the way down the road and make it into a product that's really useful for our communities. Uh, for example, the work we did with the, the Valhalla collection, the whiskey collection, um, which uh, salvaged jobs and so on, but actually, Promoted heritage. And I just want to tell you a wee bit about that, if I may, Ian, because um, it was a fine example of, you know, academic knowledge, uh, basically supporting a product, but also supporting the marketing around the product. And so what happened was that I was listening to our local radio station, Radio Orkney, on half past seven, eight o'clock in the morning. If anybody's got a fancy to listen in, it's a belter. Um, but they said that there was going to be a new range of whiskies uh, support, uh, supporting the Vikings produced by uh, the Edrington Group who own our local distillery, which is called Highland Park. 
And I thought, mm-hmm. so I phoned up and said, why haven't you consulted me? And it turned out that, of course, their, their marketing groups were in way down south. So they came to see me. And what we, we worked on was the Valhalla collection, which was basically taking some of the Norse gods and creating whiskies that reflected their characters. And we started with Thor. This was 2012. We started with Thor because um, there was a blockbuster coming out. I'll admit it. There may have been some ulterior motive in selecting Thor, although I do like Thor. And Thor is, of course, extremely popular god in the colonies. I prefer um, Freya myself. I think I think she's a lot more impressive. Uh, well, you see, this is the thing. We also had a whiskey um, in honour of Freya, which was the first whiskey called after a woman. And we gave it the colours of the Northern Lights because she is Queen of the Northern Lights mm-hmm. as well. And so we, we created Thor, Loki, uh, Freya and Odin in limited editions there. Now, when we were sitting market, uh, talking about where we we're going to market it to, um, the marketing team said, we're going to market this all to Japan. And I said, why? And they said, because Japanese like whiskey, which is well known. I said, well, why aren't you marketing it to Russia? And they said, why? I said, because Russia means the place of the Vikings. (laughs) Um, So we did do that. And uh, we were actually on News at 10 here in Britain, uh, which is the national news program, because they sold out of all of these whiskies. And I'm very proud of the fact that we were able to give the academic rigor to the backstory for the whiskies, but we were also able to take our academic abilities and actually help with the marketing and help with the actual success. I I really appreciate that. Donna, because unfortunately history gets written by the victors and uh, I think we always forget the the impact that um, Scandinavians had not only in Scotland but also in Ireland, in in England um, and also in France and and the whole of Europe and further into Eastern Europe as well as you know. So I'm really pleased that we're we're, we're, um, giving justice to that history that the, the Scandinavians added to us. And I think it makes us richer in terms of our own culture today, um, understanding that because it, it's right there in front of us. I, when I do my own DNA, there's Scandinavian elements in it. It's undeniable. And the, even though I thought I was, you know, 100% Highland Scot, no, there's Scandinavians in there, whatever that means. Well, I can tell it just by looking at you, Ian. I can tell it just by looking at you. And I myself have got my Norse cheekbones right here and my, <laughs> my DNA too. But uh, yes, and the, and the wonderful thing is that um, one of the things that, that, that made the Norse such terrific travellers was their boat, the style of boat that they had with a very short draft so they could go up very mm-hmm. um, shallow waters. And that's how they did, in fact, end up be- uh, having Normandy because the king of the Franks opened his curtains one morning in Paris and discovered that the Seine was full of Viking boats because <laughs> uh, they'd managed to sail 100 miles up it. And he palmed them off with Normandy, of course, which is part of, of France. And um, that Normandy was actually settled by uh, a lot of um, Norsemen or Vikings, if you like, from uh, Orkney and Shetland. So uh, I always say that in 1066, when they came across, it's not the Norman conquest, it's the Orkney and Shetland conquest. Absolutely. But we went everywhere, down the rivers, um, down to um, Constantinople, as it was then, which we knew as Miklagard, the big place, mm-hmm. which is a very typical Norse place name. You know, it's very direct Norse place naming. It's a big place. It's near the sea. It's a sandy bay. That's because that's what you need to know. Um, and we and we travel to all of these places. And even now today here at uh, the Institute for Northern Studies, we're very proud of all the connections that we have across the world, not just with places that are uh, to, to do specifically with um, uh, the Norse, but you'd be surprised how far they got about. For example, we have a memorandum of understanding with the University of Messina in Sicily. And Sicily, of course, was a Viking kingdom. Uh, yeah, and I, 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 again, I'm glad you mentioned, or we mentioned Normandy because I always think of Emma of Normandy have, having a touch of Freya in her and uh, another very impressive woman whose history was was forgotten for a large time as well. Fabulous. What, uh, how interesting that you should mention Emma of Normandy, the flower of Normandy, of course, as she was known, wife, of course, of Ethelred the Unready and also Canute. Um, we came along and also uh, one of the very first women to have a Psalter dedicated to her in mm-hmm. praise of her uh, fine abilities as queen. And so on. And certainly Emma had uh, certainly had her head screwed on. I think we can see that uh, very safely. A, a, a most prudent and uh, wise person who managed to maintain power for a very long time. She had sons by Ethelred, of course, that's uh, Edward the Confessor and so on. But she also had Hartha Canute. Uh, mm-hmm. with Canute, so she ruled for a considerable period of time. I mean, just do not get on the wrong side of a Norse woman, is what I say No, to you. I agree. If you've ever looked in the sagas, I would also <laughs> say too, for uh, anybody that's interested in reading the sagas, don't take a present from a disgruntled Norse woman either. 
no good will come of this. Um, <laughs> as we see in Orkneyinga Saga, where um, the mother of Sigurd the Stout is a um, ethno, she's a, a Pictish princess, and she's been the wife of the Jarl of Orkney for over 20 years, but it's clearly still rankling. So um, when he goes off to fight, um, she produces um, what's the raven banner, the, the emblem of Orkney is the raven, of course. And uh, it's uh, it's very much a, a poison chalice, that one, because she said the story is that the man who has this banner held in front of him will have victory, but the man who holds it will have death. Oh, Thanks yeah. very much. <laughs> uh, so off they go, they go and they, they all go to the Battle of Clontarf, which is a huge major um, conflict, 1014 Irish forces led by King Brian Boru. Um, and it basically leads to the defeat of Viking power in the Western seaboard in Ireland. So Sigurd, um, who's known as Sigurd the Stout, and for some reason that always seems to remind me of Captain Mannering from Dad's Army. I don't know why. <laughs> but um, but uh, so as the, as the three day battle goes on, um, one by one, the Orkney men die holding the banner. So they, they eventually end up with Sigurd and one man left. And Sigurd says, hold the banner. And the man says, um, you know, I should go. <laughs> Basically, so S Sigurd becomes enraged, rips the banner from the, the his moorings, wraps it around his portly person and uh, throws himself into the throw of battle where he's, you know, very bravely uh, killed. So Berserking only, Berserking only took them so far. <laughs> I, yeah, did, did. So I, but, I, yeah. I, I, I love these stories. I, I could talk all day about these, but I, I want to make sure we focus on one particular thing and I know you have a really exciting project underway with Scott's House in, uh, at, in as part of the INS. Can you tell us a little bit more what's happening there because it's a fascinating story. Right, well the building that we, we are in um, is called Scott's House. It's on the bay in Kirkwall which is of course a city in Royal Borough and Scott's House which we love very much is a wonderful art deco white building which we like to call either Northern Towers or the Knowledge Cube and it was originally the main offices of the Hatston Aerodrome in World War II where many American servicemen were based. Orkney's population actually went up from 20,000 to 60,000 during World War II and it was known as Fortress Orkney um, and uh, it's, it's a fully refurbished original Art Deco structure which we love very much. Unfortunately, um, we have to lease this building and we have to apply for a renewal of the lease every year. And we're never very sure whether that lease is going to be guaranteed to us. So what we'd very much like to do um, is to be able to purchase the building and keep it in, in its entirety for the work of INS. It's an uh, incredibly popular building. We have a regular stream of academics from all over the world who come to work with us because they want to be uh, in this wonderful situation that we have. Uh, at um, the Institute for Northern Studies in Scots House. So what we're aiming to do at the moment is to uh, raise the money to be able to buy the property outright and keep it safe and keep our special collections that we have there safe and the, the space that we have for our students, our PhD students who come from all over the world to study with us and our staff, um, because we do love it very, very much. And we're going we're gonna to put some links in as to how people can find out more about that. And it is a great story. It, it not only reflects on your studies on the past, but it has a definite nod to modern architecture because it's a, it's a very interesting building, but also to the impact that America had in Europe in the 20th century. Uh, and I think when you tie those things together, it's a great story for people in, in Scotland and Scandinavia, but also people in America as well. So we're gonna mm -hmm. add some links on how people can find out more and contribute, um, which would be fantastic. Um, it's not a huge amount of money that you're looking for in these days, but it's a very important amount of money in terms of the studies there and, and the islands. So we're going to add some links. People can look at those. Please do. Please subscribe to, to us, but um, please contribute to this wonderful effort that Professor Heddle is putting together. Um, do you want to say anything more about um, Scott House, or can I ask you another question, which maybe... Well, I just, I just want to say yeah. one, one, one thing, that, that um, the Institute for Northern Studies is a unique interdisciplinary um, project. There's nothing else like it in the world, and we are often asked for help to help other people set up similar things, but we are absolutely unique. So if people are looking for something really unique and really important to invest in, this is where you should be putting it. But I'm very happy to take any questions, Ian. As you know, I like to talk. You know, I, it's something I think for maybe our, our American audiences and, and also for people in Scotland, but um, we talked about the rich cultural heritage. 
Scotland is actually a pretty diverse place. You don't have to travel mm -hmm. far in Scotland to hear different accents, to, to have a different culture. Can you tell us a little bit about Orkney and Shetland in particular, the differences between them and, and also the differences between them and the mainland? Well, yes, uh, uh, this is the wonderful thing. In Scotland, we're very lucky because, we, of course, we have Gaelic, which has a lot of Norse influence in it. You see, people don't always realise that. Uh, and we have uh, Scots as well, which is a, a language of a variation of different dialects across Scotland. And we have um, the dialects of Orkney and Shetland, which are known as insular Scots. But it's not a term I'm particularly fond of. I'll just call them Orkney and Shetland, I think. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're very much based on a language called Norn, which in itself, the nearest we have to this nowadays would be modern Icelandic or Faroese, wow. um, because the Norse language is divided basically into two sections. One was a quite small one, which is West Norse, which gives you Icelandic, Faroese and Norn. East Norse gives you everything else, Swedish, German, English, Frisian, absolutely everything. That's all there, but they are connected, of course. Now, um, in, in Orkney and Shetland, we, it's a very distinctive type of dialect, and there's also a very distinctive way of speaking as well. Now, I am not using an Orkney accent to speak to you at the moment, but, you know, if I'm, I was going I'm to, not using my Glaswegian accent either, so the world is very lucky. <laughs> well, you know, for, for your listeners out there, there's a term for this in Scotland, and it's called your pan loaf voice, <laughs> uh, which means that you're speaking clearly and not using your, your dialect so that people can understand you. That's it. Like your mother might have a telephone voice. Yes. Same kind of thing. <laughs> uh, indeed. But if I was going to speak with an Orkney intonation, I might say, um, oh, I'd like a glass of wine. And you hear that the, the voice goes up at the end there. I'll not get that's too complicated for a brief chat just now. But, you know, folks, you can sign up for the Emlet in Scottish Heritage and learn all about <laughs> this from your own computers, you know. But uh, so we have a very distinct way of speaking that's extremely uh, Norse influence. We have words like PD which um, it means small, uh, and that doesn't occur anywhere else. But we also have very different ways of, of um, putting sentences together. For example, when my husband leaps from his bed in the morning, he will say to me, where's me breaks at? Where are my trousers? Right, uh, with a preposition at the end. We also tend to uh, use the verb to be rather than to have, to, to make a past tense. I'm had me tea, I'm had it. And so, yeah. But these are all very connected to Norse. So it's a very distinctive style of speech. In Shetland, it's a little bit different because they uh, they had more to do with the Europe and the Hanseatic League. So there's, there's a, a little less. We, we quite often get mistaken, mistaken for being Welsh in, in Orkney. In fact, my father-in-law, when he went to do his national service, was routinely referred to as Taffy, which is a nickname for a yeah. Welshman because of the rising intonation. Yeah. Um, and so there, but it all does tie in to the very strong uh, Norse uh, substrate in, in Scots and indeed in Gaelic um, uh, as well, so which does connect us as much as separate us. Um, and we're so very lucky in Scotland to have so many wonderful ways of expressing ourselves. And I, I love it. And, you know, I lived in Germany for a while and I, I kept seeing ways of constructing sentences um, which were different um, for, it, and, and found those, themselves into different parts of Scotland. And even words, obvious words like kirk, which don't appear in England, mm -hmm. but persist through Northern Europe into Scotland uh, for church. Yes. So, I, and we haven't even talked about the music and, and, and the, the DNA that's in the music as well, but we're getting coming to the end. So I, I want you to tell me what's next for, for you and UHI. Are there any big projects, other big initiatives coming up we should be aware of? Well, we have, we've just gone through, of course, as you've seen in the video earlier, we've just gone through a, a rebranding exercise. Uh, we're focusing very much on being more than a university, offering our communities more um, than just teaching and research. It's uh, more of a community engagement on, on many levels. Uh, for the Institute for Northern Studies, one of the areas that we're expanding into is the Arctic, which is very exciting, because of course Orkney and Shetland have very strong connections with the Arctic. Um, we have a well here in Strongness in, uh, in Orkney, which was the last place to get fresh water before you hit the Arctic. Um, yeah, the the um, key scene in the novel Frankenstein, for example, which finishes in the Arctic, was set in Orkney. Yeah. That's where Victor Frankenstein realises it's a bad idea to muck about with dead people, Ian. Uh -huh. right. Too late. Uh -huh. very, very, too late. <laughs> uh, very bad idea. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking north in many ways. We're looking in different places now because, of course, um, with Brexit and, and the United Kingdom no longer being part of the European Union, we're, we're looking very differently at, at how we're seeing the future. But we've always 
had a, 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 a longing, warm glance towards North America. And everybody I, just been... I'm with you there. I, I'm always amazed that no one puts a jigsaw together that if if you want to go across Scotland to Iceland, you're going to end up somewhere in North America. And I'm sure there's a lot more to be discovered there as well. Well, very exciting, actually, just to share with you something quite exciting out of bringing together language, actually, just as you're referring. Um, in Newfoundland, um, the archaeologists, they were looking for a place called Hop. Now, they asked me where Hop might be, and I told them exactly where it was, because a Hop is a bay that's in, enclosed in a bigger bay. Mm -hmm. So, because we have it here in St. Margaret's Hope, it's become yep. Hope in English, but mm -hmm. it's Hope, and that's how people pronounce it here. And so I said, look for a bay within a bay and you'll find the settlement, and they did. Wow. Another Viking settlement. That's so exciting. Mm -hmm. All right, Donna, I've loved the discussion. I know we're going to have many more. Um, um, hopefully sometime may actually sign up for some of your courses as well. I would oh, love to, be I'd love mm -hmm. to do that. So I want to thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the work you do uh, at UHI, but also thank you for the work you're doing for us and discovering this rich past. And uh, it's a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheery. <laughs>